You are now listening to Mark's Unexplained World by Mark the Medium. Available on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Prime, Podbean and most other podcast platforms. Tonight's episode is about the vanishing people of Gnome. So it's over to you now, Mark. In the Alaskan village of Nome, between the years of 1960 and 2004, at least 24 people, who were mostly men from neighbouring native villages, vanished without any traces of their whereabouts. There are various speculations that have been made over the years about what happened to these vanishing people of Nome. For example, Some suspect a serial killer may have been on the loose, while others theorised that it's the Alaskan region's harsh environment that's to blame. The reports themselves of the vanishing people of Nome are very real, but many of these reports, behind the reasons for their disappearances, may have been over-exaggerated, with some people reporting that they thought some of the missing 24 were victims of a UFO alien abduction, which was spurred on in 2009 by a documentary-style film called The Fourth Kind, and put a sensationalist sci-fi spin on the known Alaska disappearances. Eventually, the FBI came to investigate the mystery, Various villagers came forward with their stories about their missing friends and relatives. Relatives, sorry. With many of them expressing suspicions of foul play. Greetings, unexplainers. Thank you for tuning in again and listening to this alien abducting episode of Mark's Unexplained World. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm a psychic medium a ufologist, a true cry buff, and a podcaster. And just to give you a better idea of who I am and what I do, every Monday night I do a podcast on the various subjects under the unexplained banner. These include ufology, hauntings, disasters, and all sorts of paranormal phenomena, including true crime, unsolved crime, and missing people. So if you are listening to this show on YouTube, please give us a review and a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And if you are listening on any other podcast platform, again, give us a like and a follow. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the strange story surrounding the vanishing people of Nome. And this week's necessary disclaimer... This story is a tale that sadly involves missing people and serial murder, so it may prove upsetting to some. You listen at your own discretion. Also, all opinions and comments are strictly my own, but the facts of the case still remain. I also apologise if I pronounce anything incorrectly. My English, although it is my first and only language, as with all my podcasts, the pronunciations in this show will probably be no different. Anyway, let's get back to the story. According to Wikipedia, Nome is a city in the Nome census area in the unorganized borough of the US state of Alaska. The city of Nome itself is located on the southern seaward peninsula coast on the northern sound of the Bering Sea. In the 2020 census, it had a recorded population of 3,699, which was 101 up from the population of 3,598 recorded in the census of 2010. 
And on the 9th of April in 1901, the city of Nome was incorporated, or in other words, it was given a local self-governing body, with it once being the most populous city in Alaska. In the city's prehistory, Nome was home to the Inupiat natives, with the area coming to Western attention in 1898, when three Nordic Americans discovered gold on the ocean shores of Nome, prompting what was then later called the Nome Gold Rush. And within a year, the city of Nome went from non-existent to a population of some 10,000 people. Gold mining at Nome continued to attract settlers right up into the early 1900s, but the city's population had fallen considerably by 1910. In the winter of 1925, a diphtheria epidemic raged amongst the Alaskan natives around the Nome area, with a fierce blizzard preventing the delivery of any life-saving medications such as diphtheria antitoxin serum by airplane from nearby Anchorage. Luckily, a relay of dog sled teams was organised to deliver the antitoxin serum successfully, which was led by the Alaskan husky dogs called Balto and Togo. I couldn't miss the dogs out now, could I? This also led to the Idatarod dog sled race, which follows the same route they took back in the day that ends up in the city of Nome. In the 21st century, Nome's economy remained based around gold mining, which is now mostly carried out offshore. Nome is pretty isolated, with there being no roads to take you into the city. There are roads that lead you to and from it, but they don't link you to any of the other local communities. And from what I have read, the roads that there are, are more or less paved scenic roads that usually come to a dead end. And the reason for this? It is mainly due to the rough terrain that surrounds the city, which is mostly mountains and wetlands, and thus making it far too expensive and difficult to construct roads through. There is a ferry system leading into or out of Nome, but a lot of this purely depends on the weather at the time. So, once you are there, you ain't going nowhere. Well, not until the next flight comes along. And, if it's anything like a ferry, that is only if the weather behaves itself. Not only does Nome consist of a population of around 3,700 people, but it was also the main commercial hub in northwest Alaska's nearby isolated Seaward Peninsula, with it being the closest thing to a big city for miles and miles around. It was also a town that many of the native Inupiat village elders, sorry, both in Alaska and nearby Siberia, had warned other people to be very wary of. The tribal leader, Delbert Panguayi of Savunga, I think I've got that right, told two journalistic reporters who had come to the Anchorage Daily News back in 2005, and I quote, People disappear over here. The reports of the missing people of Nome in Alaska are very real. But there are also many cases where these circumstances have been exaggerated from time to time, with at least two dozen people that have gone missing between 1960 and 2004, sparking a nationwide uproar. After this first short break, in part two, we will look at further details of the unexplained disappearances and some of the missing people involved.
This show is brought to you courtesy of Neil Packer and the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Center. Find them online at www.hauntedresearchcenter.com or at 9 to 11 Regent Street, Hinkley, LE 10 1AW. Open on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for guided tours of the haunted rooms at just £3 per person. Booking is essential at all times and over 16s only, please, unless accompanied by an adult. The haunted rooms are extremely haunted and paranormal activity could and has taken place at any time. Some areas and particular objects or items can be quite scary and unnerving. Membership is available for £25 to qualify for selected offers. And why not download the app available on both iOS and Android for only three ninety nine to keep up to date with what is coming up at the centre. Thanks for listening to Mark's Unexplained World. If you are interested in parapsychology, quantum sciences, and true encounters with the other side, you may wish to visit the Weird Walk Home. That's my show on YouTube. Also, stay tuned, because After Dark with Tilly and Mark is creeping your way in June. Additionally, if you are interested in weird sciences, you may like to purchase my brand new book on Amazon. That would be Weird Time by Tim R. Swartz. It features lots of strange explanations and encounters with time from myself and other notable names like Lon Strickler and more. Thanks for listening. So, we know that the city of Nome has several reasons for its notoriety. These include a gold mining centre, the finish line for the now famous Idatora dog sled race, and for being a place that is successfully independent whilst being somewhat isolated. However, we cannot ignore the 24 strange disappearances as being another reason why Nome in Alaska has made a name for itself. Initially, the City of Gnome's disappearances were believed to be the work of a serial killer. The main reason behind this theory was mainly due to the large amount of people that have just simply vanished. And for a time, family and friends of these missing people, including the whole community, were on edge 24 hours a day and seven days a week thinking about who could be stalking the neighbourhood, looking for their next victim. So, let's take a look at a small handful of the people who have disappeared from the city of Nome over the years. First up is a Mr Donald Adams who disappeared in October of 1976. The Native American male Donald Adams, age, weight and height unknown, was last seen in Nome in Alaska on the 16th of October 1976. Unfortunately, there are very few details that are available on this case, but it is sufficient to say that he was never seen nor heard from again. On an interesting side note, during my research, I found that approximately 20 members of the Alaskan Native American community have either vanished or died under questionable circumstances in the known area since the 1960s. Authorities have opened a probe into their deaths and disappearances. However, they do not now believe that a serial predator was involved.
fast forward a few years to October 1998 and we look at a Mr. Archie Carl Henry Jr. 49 year old Archie Carl Henry Jr. who was 5 foot 6 in height and weighing 185 pounds resided in Gamble on St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea in Alaska in 1998 which is approximately 163 miles away from Nome. His nickname is Atmik. His family members told authorities that he visited Nome in Alaska on the 18th of October in 1998 to go shopping and spend some time with his relatives. Archie Carl Henry Jr. at the time of his disappearance was carrying a sum of money from his permanent fund dividend. His, his appearance was a Native American male with black hair, brown eyes and possibly a moustache. He was last seen in the living room of a family member's residence in Nome during the late evening hours. Archie Carl Henry Jr. has never been seen or heard from again. He left behind a wife and three children and his case remains unsolved to this day. On a short but interesting side note, St. Lawrence Island, where Archie Carl Henry Jr. lived, is a part of Alaska, but closer to Russia and Asia than to the North American mainland. St. Lawrence Island is also thought to be one of the last exposed portions of the land bridge that once joined Asia with North America during the Pleistocene period. forward again by about a year to November 1999 and we have a Mr. Lancelot Bert Immigan. 33 year old Lancelot Bert Immigan who was 5'6 in height and weighing 150 pounds was last seen by his family in Savunga in Alaska on the 2nd of November 1999. Savunga is again a city located on St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea, which, as I mentioned earlier, is approximately 163 miles away from Nome. Prior to his disappearance, Lauren, uh, sorry, Lancelot Bert Immigan told his sister that he had been beaten up on at least two occasions by some police officers in Nome and that these alleged assaults had taken place in 1998 and in the spring of 1999. He refused to report the incident, so it is unknown whether they have anything to do with his later disappearance. Lancelot Bert Immigan was planning to travel to Nome, and as Savunga is on the island, he would have had to travel to Nome by plane. He has never been seen or heard from again. Lancelot Burt Immigan was a Native American male with black hair, brown eyes and a scar on his arm. Although I cannot seem to find out if it is left or right arm. Come forward a few years again to October 2004 and we come to a Mr. Eric Apatiki. Eric Apatiki was last seen in the city of Nome in Alaska on the 5th of October in 2004. He had travelled to Nome from the island of St. Lawrence in the Bering Sea to visit his girlfriend who at the time was pregnant and carrying his son. Eric Apatiki had planned to return to his home village on the island of St. Lawrence in just a few days. However, very sadly, he has never been seen or heard from again. And although there are very few details available regarding his case, his family believed that Eric Apatiki met with foul play. Eric Apatiki was a Native American male with black hair and brown eyes although his height and weight are unknown. A few years later, in, oh, sorry, I'll try that one again. <clears throat> A few years later on again, in June 2016, we come to a Mr. Joseph Baldaras. 
36-year-old Joseph Balderas was a Roosevelt High School and Texas Tech graduate who lived in Nome. Joseph Balderas, being an avid outdoors person, went hiking and mountain running around the local city. However, when he did not show up for work the next Monday, he was reported as missing. From all accounts, search teams, which included the US Coast Guard, the National Park Service and various dog teams, searched for nearly two weeks and covered up to 400 square mile area. However, no trace of Joseph Baldaris was ever found. Brian Schultz, who was remarkably uh, sorry, who was a remarkably close friend of Joseph Baldaris, said, and I quote, What really baffles me and really irks me is that those German shepherds have not found one drop of blood. He continued, and I quote, Not a drip, not a clue, nothing. A driver claimed to have seen Joseph Baldaris on the Saturday of the 25th of June 2016, at mile 44 on the No Council Highway. On the 7th of June 2017, almost a whole year after his disappearance, a jury of six came to the unanimous conclusion that Joseph Baldaris was dead. And so Magistrate Judge Heidi K. Ivanov signed a presumptive death order following the presumptive death hearing from the jury trial. On an interesting side note, the Presumption of Death Act 2013 provides a way for the relatives of a missing person to apply for a declaration of presumed dead. The main purpose of this is to allow the relatives to deal with the financial affairs of the missing person. It can also provide closure, especially if the person has been missing for a long time. In short, the declaration of presumed death will allow the family and loved ones of, missing, of a missing person sorry, to deal with that person's money and property and distribute it in accordance with either their will, if they have left one, or, if there is no will, with the intestacy rules. Although Joseph Balderas has been officially claimed as deceased by the Bal uh, deceased, the Balderas family refuses to give up looking for evidence as to his disappearance. Let us look at one more missing person of Nome for this podcast before we get into part three. Thirty-three-year-old Florence Helen. Ukpiluk, who, it has been said, went missing, missing on the 31st of August 2020. Although there does appear to be a conflict here on the actual date she was last seen, with some websites claiming it to be the 30th of August and others claiming the 1st of September, but I'll let you decide. Florence Helen Ukpiluk was an alcoholic at 5 foot 2 in height and 142 pounds in weight. She was an Alaskan native of the aforementioned Inupiat people and grew up in Wales, which is a small village about 100 miles northwest of Nome in Alaska. At the time of her disappearance, Florence Helen Ukpiluk was living with her boyfriend in an apartment in the city of Nome. She was reportedly struggling with alcohol and was urged by her family to get help. Florence Helen Ukpiluk shared custody of her six-year-old daughter with the child's father. She was also very close to her daughter and enjoyed passing on to her many of the native Alaskan traditions. It appears that on the 29th of August 2020, Florence Helen Ukpiluk had had an argument with her sister over her use of alcohol. She was last seen coming out of a tent on West Beach, which is about one or two miles outside of Nome. She has never been seen or heard from since, and her jacket and shoes were all that was left outside her tent. 
On the 30th of August 2020, a pickup truck was captured on a security camera between 7am and 10am near the Nome port, a day before Florence Helen Uptkeluk was reported missing. On the 13th of September that same year, authorities announced that the driver and vehicle of the pickup truck were located but did not share any further details to protect the investigation. I feel I must stress here that the driver of the pickup truck, whose name has not been made public, was not listed as a suspect. Foul play is suspected in Florence Ukkeluk's disappearance, but the circumstances surrounding it remain unclear. She is currently classified as missing, and the investigation is currently active and ongoing, but the case remains unsolved. After this second short break, in part three, we will look at Why do some people seem to vanish? David Polidi's missing 411 phenomena and some of the theories as to why the people of Nome just seem to disappear. Fright Nights was established in 1999 as the first company in the world to offer overnight ghost hunt experiences to the general public pioneering paranormal events since the last century. Fright Nights operate at hundreds of the UK's most haunted and exclusive venues. All events have their own team of experienced paranormal investigators, mediums and psychics. They have a VIP members club for regular returning guests, offering loyalty discounts and exclusive invitation only events. They can also host private events for your family and friends. You can contact them on 07 852 998 628 or email them at office at frightnights.co.uk or take a look at their website at www.frightnights.co.uk where you can see the many locations they investigate and learn about them and the opportunities they have available. Hundreds of ghost hunters join Fright Nights every month for the most thrilling ghost hunting experiences they'll never forget. If you haven't been on a ghost hunt before, then why not join them to see what it's all about? Why not visit their social media sites for up-to-date information on all the places they visit and to see what's coming up in the future? They look forward to seeing you all soon. Fright Nights, Ghost Hunting Events. Remember, only the original will do. Okay, before I get back into the main topic of this podcast, let us look at the subject of missing people in general as a whole. According to Wikipedia, a missing person is a person who has disappeared and whose status as alive or dead cannot be confirmed, as their location and condition are both unknown. A person may go missing through a voluntary disappearance or else due to an accident, a crime, death in a location where they cannot be found, such as at sea, or many other reasons. While criminal abductions are some of the most widely reported missing person cases, these accounts for only, sorry, these accounts are only 2.5% of missing children in Europe and most parts of the world, a missing person will usually be found reasonably quickly. By contrast, there are some missing person cases that remain unresolved for many years. 
The laws related to these long-term cases are often very complex, since in many jurisdictions, relatives and third parties cannot deal with the deceased person's assets until their death is considered proven by law and a formal death certificate is issued. The situation, the uncertainties, together with the lack of closure or funeral resulting when a person goes missing, may be extremely painful, with long-lasting effects on family and friends. There are, of course, a number of organisations that seek to connect or share best practices and spread helpful information and images of missing children to improve the effectiveness of missing children's investigations. These organisations include the International Commission on, Mission, on Missing Persons, the International Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, or the ICMEC for short, as well as other national organisations. People disappear for many reasons. Some individuals choose to disappear, while other people disappear inadvertently, for example by getting lost, or it is imposed on them by an abduction or an imprisonment. There are, of course, many other reasons for someone's disappearance. For example, leaving home to live in an unknown place and under a new identity. This has also been nicknamed the Reggie Perrin Syndrome, which leads me quite nicely into an interesting side note. The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin is a British sitcom starring the late great actor Leonard Rossiter in the title role. Three series were produced from 1976 to 1979. The story concerns a middle-aged middle manager, Reginald Reggie Perrin, who is revealed in, his first, in the first series to be aged 46 and is driven to bizarre behaviour by the pointlessness of his job at Sunshine Desserts. So, as a drastic measure, he decides to leave his nine-to-five mundane job and his beautiful wife Elizabeth Perry, played by actress Pauline Yates, by leaving a fake suicide note and leaving his clothes piled neatly on a beach and going off to start a new life in a new place with a new name. Other reasons for someone's disappearance might include, for example, they need to escape domestic abuse, mental illness or other ailments such as Alzheimer's disease which can cause people to forget where or who they are, joining a cult or other religious organisation that require no contact with the outside world, or even perhaps an aviation incident or a shipwreck where no wreckage has ever been found. So, let us now look, or take a look, at the missing 411 phenomena. Missing 411 is a series of books and films written and produced by former police officer David Polidis, which documents cases of people who have gone missing in national parks and elsewhere, and he asserts that these cases are both unusual and mysterious. According to David Polidis, his work on the missing 411 phenomena began when he was doing some research in a national park and an off-duty park ranger found him and expressed his concern about the questionable nature of some of the missing person cases which had occurred throughout the parks. The ranger, knowing uh, uh, David Polidis' background, asked him if he could do some research on this issue. And being the natural investigator that he was, David Polidis obliged and asserts that he uncovered multiple lines of evidence which suggested negligence on the part of the Park Service in failing to locate the missing people. David Polidis then broadened his investigation to include missing people from across the world, 
which led to his belief that he has uncovered a mysterious series of worldwide disappearances which he said defied logical and conventional explanations. As of August 2021, David Politis has written at least 10 books on this topic of missing 411. And although as yet he does not have a theory on what is causing all these strange disappearances, he does indicate that the, and I quote, fields of suspects is narrowing. David Pelagius also advised his readers to go outside their normal comfort zone in order to determine, sorry, in order to determine who or what the culprit is. On a personal note, I myself have read a couple of his books and seen all his documentary films many times over. And I have to say that they are both groundbreaking and mind-blowing at the same time. But I do agree with what he says in that you do need to watch them or read them with an open mind. Take a look, see what you think. So, let us get back to the subject of the known disappearances. There are roughly 350 miles of roads radiating from the city of Nome that lead deep into the deep into some of Alaska's pristine country. And by what I have read and researched, the lonely vastness of the area would be so easy to disappear into and to never be seen or heard from again. Or in other words, Nome has hundreds of miles of private roads that are perfect for a possible UFO abduction, or worse, for actually dumping a body. The known Alaska disappearances gained much worldwide attention and popularity from a 2009 Hollywood movie called The Fourth Kind. It was originally sold as a science fiction thriller directed by Ulatunde Usonna Sonny and featured a cast including Mila Jovovich and Will Patton. The title itself is derived from the explanation of J. Allen Hynek's classification of close encounters with aliens, in which the fourth kind denotes actual alien abduction. And just a short side, of, uh, side note of interest here, Joseph Allen Hynek was an American astronomer, professor and ufologist who is perhaps best remembered for his UFO research. Joseph Allen Hynek acted as a scientific advisor to UFO studies undertaken by the US Air Force under three separate projects, Project Sign, Project Grudge and Project Blue Book. In later years he conducted his own independent UFO research, developing the Close Encounter Classification System. He was among the first people to conduct scientific analysis of reports and especially of trace evidence purportedly left by UFOs. The film, The Fourth Kind, is a pseudo-documentary purporting to be a dramatic reenactment of true events that occurred in Nome, Alaska, in which a psychologist uses hypnosis to uncover memories of alien abduction from her parents and Patience. finds evidence suggesting that she may have been abducted as well. At the beginning of the film, Mila Jovovich informs the audience that this entire movie is actually real and that she will be playing a character based on a real person named Abigail Tyler and that the film will feature archival footage of the real Abigail Tyler. The real Abigail Tyler is seen in the archival footage and is played by actor Charlotte Milchard. At various points throughout the film, the archival footage scenes and accompanying dramatic reenactments are presented side by side. 
The film was basically set in the city of Nome and largely told the tale of how the missing people there were assumed to be alien abduction related. Now, although the film itself did receive negative reviews, I personally enjoyed it very much, but then I do love a good alien thriller. And again, see what you think. So, what is the story of all these missing people in the city of Nome in far out Alaska? Are we talking UFOs and alien abductions? Well, from what I can see, there have been plenty of discussions about these strange disappearances that often include talks about Nome being a place with a high number of UFO sightings. But there's also a lot of discussions around the possibility of a serial killer being the culprit behind these disappearances. Although, to me, it's such a mixture of different people that have gone missing. And from what I have read, most serial killers tend to go for their own particular type of personal victim. Unless, of course, whoever it was, he or she was just picking different people at random with a sort of, what the hell, I'll just go for it anyway, attitude. Or could it be something less complicated, like a simple human error? Like someone just having too much to drink one night and wandering off in the wrong direction. And with Nome being right out in the middle of nowhere, I can imagine it must be quite easy to get lost, especially at night, in the dead of winter. According to an FBI investigation, it was determined that these disappearances were largely a combination of excessive alcohol consumption <laughs> and the harsh winter climate. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World. In our next episode, our 100th show, put the flags out, Mark, we are going to be looking at Pete the Poltergeist. In a lawnmower repair shop somewhere in Cardiff, John and Fred Matthews, who were the co-owners, began hearing what sounded like stones being thrown in the workshop. They'd heard this sort of noise many times before, usually from the local teenagers being a nuisance, tossing bricks at the building. So Fred, who believed it was kids who were mucking about again, went outside to investigate. However, when he got outside, he was stunned to find nothing. No kids, no flying stones, nothing. Just a quiet street with no one around, or certainly no one visible at any rate. This was just the beginning of a long campaign of mischief and tricks from a poltergeist spirit that the owners of the shop decided to call Pete. This show was written and researched by myself, Mark Hughes, and proofread and edited by Linda Hughes. The pronunciation of all the names, as usual, was all mine. The actors in this episode were Mark Hughes, Linda Hughes, Denise Pula, and Tilly Treadwell from the Weird Walk Home podcast. With special thanks to Neil Packer and the staff at the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre in Hinkley. And a big thank you to everyone for listening. And again, just to add, if you are listening to this show on YouTube, please give us a review and a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And, to, and if you are listening on any other podcast platforms, again, give us a like and a follow. A thank you in advance. Mark's Unexplained World, because there's more to the paranormal than meets the third eye. And remember guys, keep it real, because being real is better than being perfect. This show and all its contents are covered by basic copyright of Mark the Medium. <laughs>